Good afternoon. I'm Michael Nock, Dean of the Goldman School of Public Policy on the Berkeley campus, and it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, you uh, to a special guest who's here to discuss uh, a very important and controversial subject about, about Islam. And if you permit me, I need a couple of minutes of background information to convey to you both about what we're doing here at Berkeley on these subjects and also about our speaker. I mean, obviously, historically, uh, the academic community has always had an interest in Islam, either in, from an area studies perspective, as part of understanding Egypt or other great uh, Islamic societies, or looking at the history, culture, theology of Islam itself. Um, but I would say most of, the, most of this work was largely confined to the academy. And it really wasn't until uh, the events of 9-11 and then the follow-up uh, Bush administration decision to uh, go to war in Iraq that the, the whole question of the future of Islam and what Islam is all about and its variations has now become a major issue of national importance and public discussion. Uh, in response to these events, uh, Berkeley is trying in its own way uh, to provide different forms to educate all of us on uh, these very difficult and important questions. And as one example, I want to call your attention to a really major conference that will be convened this Friday, all day. So if you're interested in this subject, you'll definitely be interested in the Friday conference, Democracy and Globalism. And there are uh, uh, flyers here for our uh, conference direct from our conference director Hetty Reese, and she can provide you more information about that if you would like. Uh, this conference will be held all day Friday from nine in the morning till six in the evening uh, in the Lipman Room and on the eighth floor of Barrows Hall, just five minutes from here, and it, it will attract many very noted Islamists and experts from around around the world. And just to give you an idea of how collaborative an effort it was to put this conference on, it is co-sponsored by, sit back and relax, the Institute of Governmental Studies, the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, the Center for Southeast Asian Studies, the French Department, the Graduate Theological Union, the Institute of European Studies, the uh, Directorate of International and Area Studies, the Townsend Center for the Humanities, the French Studies Program, and the Institute for the Study of National Security within the European Union. So there are about 10 different organizations sponsoring this program. Uh, and that will be, as I said, a very uh, serious and considered s somewhat academic but deep discussion of such issues as the interplay among Islam, democracy, global globalization, and alternative interpretations of Islam. Uh, in a way, uh, as sort of a run-up to that conference, we're very pleased to have uh, with us Ms. Urshad Manji. And let me, I know many of you may know a lot about her, but let me just summarize her very interesting background. She studied in Canada and is a resident of Toronto. She went to UBC, University of British Columbia, which is, in my own experience, one of the most beautiful campuses I've ever been on. It's not too far away from here and also was a writer and resident at the University of Toronto. And of course, increasingly, Berkeley and Toronto have closer ties now that our new chancellor is here, Bob Bergenau, who was president of the University of Toronto until six months ago. So this is maybe a continuation of the Toronto-Berkeley uh, dialogue. Uh, she's been an activist. Uh, she's been a writer, a, a journalist of various kinds. She's done a lot of different things, but she really broke into the national scene with the publication of this book, the Trouble with Islam Today, A Muslim's Call for Reform in Her Faith. Uh, and this book has been a New York Times bestseller. It's been widely praised by scholars and journalists. Uh, I think it's also been attacked, which is sometimes a compliment, sometimes not. It was cited by one person as uh, bin Laden's greatest fear, which uh, the author take, authors takes as a compliment. And she's been a host of a Canadian program, Big Ideas, television program, and other things where she has been able to articulate the, these views. Um, the ground rules for the discussion today are as follows. Um, Ms. Manji will speak for about 40 or 45 minutes. 
and we'd very much uh, request that there be no interruptions of any kind during her remarks. Uh, when she finishes, she's delighted to entertain questions and comments, and there are, there's a microphone over there. Is there any other microphone, Kate? Is, it, is that the only one? I'm sorry, there's one over here. So there are two microphones. Please come up to the uh, mics and wait your turn. But we just ask you to be relatively brief in your question or your comment so she has time to respond to as many remarks as possible. And we will end a little bit before 5.30. And uh, uh, Ms. Manji will be able to continue discussions with those of you who are interested outside, where she will also be signing her book. Okay? So with that, uh, please give a warm welcome to Urshad Manji. Well, thank you very much, Michael. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, and I thank you all, especially for coming out on a gorgeous Tuesday afternoon. Uh, I take this uh, uh, wonderful turnout as a great sign of your interest, and I hope that I live up to your expectations, at least in intriguing you with more questions and in sparking more conversations. Um, let me begin by stating what might seem obvious to most of you, but what I think nonetheless needs to be said. And that is, whenever anybody challenges religious conviction, doesn't matter who holds those religious convictions and who's doing the challenging. Whenever anybody challenges deeply held religious beliefs, it's an emotional risk. Let's put aside the word risk for a second, because that has security connotations. Let's talk about the word emotional. Whenever you challenge religious conviction, you're not simply asking people to concede this issue or rethink that point. No. You're doing something much more primal. You're challenging pride, self-esteem, ego, and ultimately, identity. So I totally appreciate why so many of my fellow Muslims can get defensive about the kinds of ideas that I'm going to explore with you this afternoon. But to anybody who has come to this event with defensiveness in his or her heart, let me just assure you that since the release of this book, my own identity as a faithful Muslim has been vigorously challenged, even impugned. And yet, I stand before all of you thoroughly secure in my identity as a faithful Muslim faithful enough to take seriously that verse in the Quran, Islam's holy book, which states, believers, conduct yourselves with justice and bear true witness before God, even if it be against yourselves, your parents, or your family. And it's in that spirit of faithfulness that I've come to Berkeley today. Let me uh, start by exploring some of the ideas in my book and then I'll explain why I am insanely passionate, or just plain insane, according to some people, about promoting these ideas at the risk of my own life. And then we'll throw it open to what I trust will be a feisty Q&A. The trouble with Islam today is an open letter from me, a Muslim voice of reform, to concerned citizens worldwide, Muslim and not. And it's about why my faith community needs to come to terms with the diversity of ideas, of people, of belief systems in our universe, and how non-Muslims, in my judgment, have a crucial role to play in helping us get there. Now, the kinds of themes that I'm exploring in this open letter, with what I intend is the utmost honesty, includes the ill treatment of too many women in the Muslim world today. Historically, by the way, it wasn't like this during the Prophet Muhammad's time. The Jew bashing and Jew baiting, in which too many Muslims persistently engage, even here in the West. And the continuing scourge of slavery in regions that are ruled by Islamist regimes. Notice, by the way, folks, that I use the word Islamist, not Islamic. Islamism being a political perversion of the faith of Islam. An ideology, really a bastard ideology, wielded by those with a particular violent axe to grind. Well, you can see that given this range of issues that I've just laid out on the metaphorical table before you, 
women, religious minorities, slaves, that they all fall under the grander umbrella of universal human rights. And it is because I do believe that human rights are universal that I do not believe any group, any community, any ethnicity, any culture, any religion ought to be immune from scrutiny on that front, namely respecting the universality of human rights. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I emphasize both in my book and here before you that every religion has its share of literalists. American Christianity has its evangelicals, some of whom still populate the highest office in the land. Jews have their ultra-Orthodox, though many ultra-Orthodox Jews have tried to convince me that, hey, Irshad, at least we believe in continuous interpretation. Yeah, I reply. Try telling that to the Jewish women in Israel, including the secular types, who have to go to rabbinical courts in order to seek divorces from their husbands and often wind up not with divorces, but with the shaft. Try telling them that. Even Buddhists, for God's sakes, have fundamentalists. Now, don't ask me how that one works. That may be another book for another author, and if I may inject some cheap Buddhist humor, for another lifetime. At least I'm honest enough to acknowledge it's cheap humor. But the difference, I would argue, is that only within Islam today is literalism mainstream worldwide. And let me explain what I mean by that rather provocative and sweeping statement. We Muslims, even here in North America, are routinely raised to believe that because the Quran comes after the Torah and the Bible, historically and chronologically, it is the final and therefore perfect manifesto of God's will. Not given to the kinds of ambiguities and inconsistencies and outright contradictions and, God forbid, human editing like all of those other so-called sacred texts. No, no. Even moderate Muslims believe, as an article of faith, that the Quran is not like any other sacred text. It is, and I think I'll be understood in the Silicon Valley area when I say this, it is God 3.0 and none shall come after it. Okay? Now this is a supremacy complex. And it's a supremacy complex that I'm arguing is dangerous. Why dangerous? Not because I believe that moderate, decent Muslims will suddenly become jihadists and begin hurling bombs at the so-called infidels. No, please. That's a shallow argument. I wouldn't go there. I resort to what my fellow Muslims often believe is another shallow argument. I, um, I argue that this supremacy complex is dangerous because when abuse happens under the banner of Islam today, most Muslims today even those of us with fancy titles and formal educations do not yet know how to debate and dissent with the jihadists. And that's not what, because we're stupid, and it's not because we don't want to. It's because we have not yet been introduced to the possibility of asking questions about our perfect holy book. The same I would humbly submit to all of you cannot be said today for moderate Christians and Jews. And this, I think, holds the key to explaining why there has been such a thundering silence among moderate Muslims in the face of Islamist terror. You see, the jihadists are so expert at quoting from the Quran, and because we Muslims have been told that we cannot question the Quran, we are left with the feeling that to question the jihadists out loud is to question the Qur'an itself. And that is supposed to be off limits. Well, I'm here to say that questioning even the Qur'an is not off limits. And not because spiky-haired feminist Irshad Manji says so. Who cares what Irshad Manji thinks? It's because Islamic tradition says so. Probably the major point in my book is that Islam once exuded a glorious tradition of independent thinking, 
known as ijtihad. Ijtihad. Now I realize that this word sounds frighteningly like jihad to many non-Arab ears. May not be so frightening to a Berkeley crowd, but it is in much of America, and I appreciate that. And in fact, this word ijtihad comes from the same root as jihad, to struggle. But unlike any notion of violent struggle, and please keep in mind, jihad does not mean violent struggle, but unlike any notion of violent struggle, ijtihad is all about independent thinking and independent reasoning. In fact, in the early centuries of Islam, thanks to the spirit of ijtihad, 135 schools of thought flourished. In Muslim Spain, scholars would teach their students to abandon, quote, expert opinion about the Quran if their own conversations with the ambiguous Quran came up with better evidence for their peaceful ideas. And in Cordoba, one of the most sophisticated cities in Muslim Spain, there were 70 libraries. 70. Now that rivals the number of libraries in most cosmopolitan cities today. Sadly, it also rivals the number of McDonald's in most cosmopolitan cities today. But uh, we'll save that for another speaker on another sunny afternoon. I think that it's important to point out that so much of what we in this part of the world take for granted as being Western pop culture was in fact shaped by Muslims thanks to ijtihad. Let me just give you a quick partial list of these contributions. Muslims gave the world among the first universities in recorded history. It was known as the House of Wisdom, and it sprang up in 9th century Baghdad. Muslims gave the world, you'll love this, mocha coffee. You're welcome. Muslims gave the world the beginnings of cough syrup, the guitar, and even that ultra-Spanish expression, ole, which has its root in which Arabic word? Anyone in the audience? Ole. Allah, Allah, believe it or not. Now you'll just have to blame Ricky Martin on someone else, okay? I think that the beauty of emphasizing this concept of ijtihad is that I'm not asking my fellow Muslims to import a foreign tradition or an alien virtue into the faith, not at all. I'm reminding them, and in many cases, let me be honest, educating them that Islam once had this progressive pluralistic tradition, and that there is no reason we cannot have it again, no reason save for pure politics. We'll get into that momentarily. For now, let me say that it is in this vein that I want to offer a suggestion that's a little bit paradoxical. It may be that those Muslims who are best positioned to revive ijtihad are not living in the Islamic world, but living right here in the West. Well, wait a minute, you might think. Why would it be Muslims in the West who can resuscitate ijtihad? Simple. Because it is here that we already enjoy precious freedoms to think, express, challenge, and be challenged without fear of government retaliation. Now before anybody wants to jump down my throat for having said that, let me clarify. I am not for a moment denying, not for a moment, that Muslims, especially in the United States, are also targeted for harassment, discrimination, and profiling by the government. I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that I experienced something similar in my own country of kinder, gentler Canada. At the beginning of 1991 Gulf War, I was a legislative assistant to a member of parliament. I was in a Senate committee hearing, studiously taking notes for my boss, when I received an unceremonious and unexpected tap on my shoulder by a man in uniform who marched me out of that federal government building for absolutely no stated reason, and to this day, no stated apology. And I truly appreciate that many Muslims, particularly men in this country, go through infinitely worse than that. So I do get it. When some say to me, Irshad, it's open season on us. We're under siege. Why are you making things harder for us? 
by talking about this stuff now. Well, the point that I'm making in my book does not diminish the reality of many Muslims in America. Quite the opposite. It highlights it. But it goes one better. I'm saying that if we Muslims care as much about the human rights of other Muslims who are living in conditions of repression as we do about our civil rights right here in the United States, then in fact it is from the United States and Canada that we can agitate for those human rights without worrying about being maimed, raped, imprisoned, uh, tortured, or murdered at the hands of the state for doing so. I speak as a refugee when I say this is a precious gift. And I'm asking my fellow Muslims, what in God's name are we doing with this gift? Now, here's the thing. Even if the liberal Islamic reformation begins in the West, and that's a big if, I realize God knows it doesn't end in the West, not by a long shot. People throughout the Islamic world, women in particular, need to know of their God-given right to think for themselves. And so in the trouble with Islam today, I take the trouble to outline a global campaign to promote innovative approaches to Islam. And I call this thoroughly non-military campaign, Operation Ijtihad. And Operation Ijtihad begins by liberating the entrepreneurial talents of women in the Muslim world, by giving them micro-enterprise loans of $100, $200, $300. And what could they do with these loans? Well, obviously, as the name suggests, micro-enterprise, they start community businesses. But that's just the beginning. You see, there is actual consensus within Islam that when a Muslim woman earns her own assets, let's say from a business, she gets to keep 100% of those assets and do with them as she sees fit. And what could Muslim women do with these assets? Well, for starters, they could become literate. They could learn to read the Quran for themselves and thereby see all of the options that the Quran gives them for self-respect, rather than merely swallowing holus bolus the selected verses that mullahs and imams tend to shove down their throats. A friend of mine, a photographer, spent the last six months in Afghanistan. She came back to her home in the United States three weeks ago and excitedly called me up to say, you know the verses the progressive verses in the Quran that you identified in your book. I met a woman who took a, non, uh, who took a, a business loan from a non-governmental organization. She started her own business. She learned to read the Quran for herself. She found the verses you're talking about. She recited them to her abusive husband. And ever since then, he has not laid an unwanted finger on her. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the power not just of the Quran, but also of literacy. And what else could Muslim women do? They could also start their own schools. And indeed, that is what is happening in some parts of Kabul today, where they're starting schools, these women, and in some of these schools you can read signs that say, and I'm going to go from right to left because it's in Urdu, educate a boy, and you educate only that boy, but educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. As economists might like to put it, the multiplier effect of investing in Muslim women cannot be underestimated. Now, the question that hangs over a campaign or an idea like this is the following. Great, but would Islam allow Muslim women to participate en masse as entrepreneurs rather than as exceptions? My answer? big time. And I can explain that in a couple of ways. Let's talk practically first and foremost. Some of you may know that the whole micro-lending movement began more than 30 years ago in part because of a Muslim man named Muhammad Yunus. In Bangladesh, he started something called the Grameen Bank. And Grameen is the Bengali word for village. And this is a kind of bank that makes tiny loans to the poorest of the world's poor, most of whom are landless, most of whom are women. 
And the 30 plus year track record of the micro lending movement shows without a, without a doubt that when Muslim women use these loans, they're used not just to lift their quality of life, but indeed that of their families, sometimes entire neighborhoods, sometimes even whole villages. So there's something profoundly pragmatic about this and proven. But there, I think, is an even more exciting answer to whether Islam would allow women to participate as entrepreneurs. And it's a theological answer. The Prophet Muhammad's beloved first wife, Khadija, was herself a merchant for whom the Prophet worked for many, many years. She was his boss. And I sometimes like to remind Muslim men that if they're serious about emulating the Prophet's life, they won't simply grow long beards, they'll be very open to working for their wives. This does not always crack a smile, but it does get, from time to time, nods of acknowledgement, usually from the Muslim guys in the back, where they can't readily be seen. And I like to tease some of them, you know, after the event is over. Hey, I saw you nodding your head at that point. What were you agreeing with? And over and over again, the answer comes back, Irshad, we know that when the brothers oppose women as economic players, they oppose this, not because they fear violating the Quran, they won't be, but because they fear losing personal privileges that come from comfortable cultural traditions. Because I'm on a university campus, I have to take this point just a step further. There is also a very sophisticated group of Muslims, usually operating from the comfort of their offices um, in, uh, in the Ivory Tower, who insist that introducing free enterprise to the Arab Middle East amounts to Western imperialism, whether or not women benefit. This too needs to be challenged, because remember, historically, the most tolerant strains of Islam have been spread through merchant trade, not military conquest. And merchant trade emanating from where? From the Arab Middle East. In particular, from Baghdad, the seat of the Islamic Enlightenment between you know, the 8th and the 12th century. I mean, this was a crossroads of goods and services and ideas. In fact, the history between Islam and micro-capital is so tight that there is this gorgeous Arabic saying that I'm going to deliver for you in English. And it goes like this. May your pilgrimage be accepted, your sins be forgiven, and your merchandise never remain unsold. Priorities. There's even a theory based on the Quran itself about when investors can come collecting on their loans. And the theory is only after the people in whom they have invested have managed to create new wealth, but not a moment before. What a wonderful theological cushion for those Muslim women who choose to accept micro-enterprise loans. So what am I ultimately driving at here? This being a school of policy, let me tell you, I think it's worth exploring whether they ought to be and forgive the phrase, a new coalition of the willing. That is to say, rich countries from around the world, Canada, Britain, Norway, the United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Japan, Australia, Britain, or I said that already, France, Germany, the United States, taking just a sliver of their defense budgets, all of them, and pooling them into a coherent program of micro-business loans for women in the Muslim world. This is known as the exercise of soft power. And lest anybody in this audience automatically assume that your president simply wouldn't get the wisdom of such an idea, well, you might be right, but you might not. At Stanford University recently, I was um, speaking uh, on a program that included General John Abizade the head of central command in Iraq for the United States. And General Abizade spoke before I did. You'll see why that's important to note in just a second. But after he spoke, a woman in the audience raised her hand, not me, and she asked, General, 
Is there anything that we Americans can do to compensate for our mistakes in Iraq without resorting to more guns and ammo? And without any hesitation, the general replied, yeah, micro-business loans for Muslim women. Well, <clears throat> I went up to him afterwards, and remember, he spoke before I did, so it's not like he needed any prompting from me. I went up to him afterwards and I said, excuse me, General, um, ha have you read my book? And he replied, I'm sorry, you are who? And I thought, oh, General, take my spleen while you're at it. But I am so thrilled, in retrospect, not, on that, uh, not at that moment, that he replied as honestly as, it, as he did, because it showed me that he didn't need anybody like me telling him how important the exercise of this kind of soft power can be, even in insurgency-riddled parts of Iraq. So it seems to me that if George W. Bush is serious about listening to his generals, he will take a listen to what Abizaid had to say that day. And I invite all of you to write just a quick note to your president about what Abizaid had to say that day. Let's not let him get away with denial. So you see, despite the title of the book, The Trouble with Islam Today, this is not an unremitting attack on Islam as it is practiced widely. It is indeed a healthy critique of Islam but a healthy enough critique to bring into sharp relief that tradition of ijtihad which once allowed the rest of the world to take a lead from Islam in curiosity, creativity, and innovation. Now, the question has often been asked since the release of my book, are you insane? I mean, Irshad, why would you put your name, your face, that hair, on the cover of a book that tackles the cornerstone taboos of contemporary Islam? Are you nuts? Well, Mom, I reply, please hear me out. And she has. And if we have time, I'll explain what her own journey has been in all of this. But for now, I ask you to give me a fair hearing. Let me explain why I am indeed insanely passionate about promoting these ideas. My family and I are refugees from Idi Amin's Uganda. We settled just outside of Vancouver in 1972, and I grew up attending two types of schools, the regular, secular, public school of most North American kids, and then on top of that, every Saturday for several hours at a stretch, the Islamic religious school, the madrasa. And that's where, I'm sorry to say, I regularly imbibed two major messages. That women are inferior, and that the Jews are treacherous, not to be trusted. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have never said, nor would I ever say, that every madrasa teaches these things. I couldn't even say most of them do. How the heck would I know what most of them teach? I haven't been into most of them, thank goodness for them, and not just for me. But since I'm explaining to you where my passion comes from, it's vital that I convey to you, in addition to the analysis I've just given, a glimpse also of my lived experiences. Because we're all a product of our lived experiences in some ways, and that's where the authenticity resides. That's where the sincerity is. And so I can tell you that my lived experiences included the fact that even back then, at the age of eight, nine, ten, I had enough faith to ask questions. By the way, why do I use the word faith? Faith, it seems to me, is secure enough to handle questions. Faith never needs to be threatened by questions. You know what does? Dogma. Big difference, faith and dogma. I had enough faith to ask questions like, why can't girls lead prayer? A question I know many Jewish and Christian women have wanted to ask of their own religious leaders, and some have. I graduated, and when I say graduated, take it metaphorically, to uh, asking more sophisticated questions like, hold on, sir. If the Quran came to Prophet Muhammad as a message of peace, then why, even after receiving that message, 
did he command his army to slay an entire Jewish tribe. You can appreciate that such questions irritated the hell out of my madrasa teacher. He was human after all, and in his case, he felt quite entitled to put down women and slag the Jews. And so it's not surprising that he and I reached our ultimate impasse over yet another one of my annoying, ignorant questions. Namely, where is the evidence for the so-called Jewish conspiracy against Islam? You'd love to go on about it, sir. Tell me, where is the proof? I have a confession to make right off the top here. I realize that in retrospect, this question may have been an unintentionally trick question on my part. Because what he was feeding us were conspiracy theories. And let's face it, conspiracy theories, by definition, don't lend themselves to evidence, right? Hello? That's what makes them conspiracy theories. I didn't get it back then. I get it now. I just don't buy it now. And that's why I keep asking such questions out loud. Well, that question, where is the proof of the Jewish plot against the faith of Islam, that question, first posed by me at the age of 14, got me booted out of the madrasa. And at this point, I had a crucial choice to make. Sure, I could have walked away from my Muslim faith and got on with becoming a materialistic North American for whom the mall is the god, as some Muslims quietly do. Or I could have given Islam another chance and asked Islam to give me another chance. And out of fairness to my faith, ladies and gentlemen, this time I say fairness because maybe my madrasa teacher was just a lousy educator, not that we'd know about those at Berkeley, but maybe he was a lousy educator, and why should my faith be punished for his shortcomings? So I took time over the next 20 years to study Islam on my own. And I'm so pleased to say that as a result of all of that self-study, I came to discover a truly progressive side of my faith, ijtihad. Problem is, I discovered it in theory. You see, I remain a struggling, and therefore, I would argue, faithful Muslim, one who asks questions because of what's happening not in theory, but on the ground. Human rights violations, often massive ones, particularly against women and religious minorities in the name of Islam. Now, I'm sure some of you have heard, and I can assure you, I certainly have heard, many decent Muslims say to me, the kind of Islam that I've just described, one that's riddled with human rights violations, is not real Islam. It's not true Islam. And I happen to believe that those who make such an argument are right but we can't leave it there. We can't simply pretend that a problem doesn't exist. I have to challenge my fellow decent Muslims to come clean about something. Is the kind of Islam that they are reflexively defending, not always reflectively, but often reflexively, is that Islam in its real or Islam in its ideal form? Because let's face it, Everything is wonderful as an ideal. Communism is egalitarian as an ideal. Capitalism, eminently fair as an ideal. The United States Constitution guarantees liberty and justice for all as an ideal. Many African Americans, women, gays and lesbians, and oh yes, Muslims would argue that the reality is very different and they would be right. So why can't we acknowledge the same about the practice of Islam, that its realities are different from its ideals? And you know, I think that the way I've just described this would have been appreciated by the Prophet Muhammad himself. I think he would have embraced this distinction between real and ideal, because when he was reportedly asked, what is religion? The prophet reportedly replied, religion is the way we conduct ourselves toward others. 
a fine definition, simple without being simplistic. And yet think about it, folks. By that definition, how we Muslims actually conduct ourselves, how we behave is Islam. And please appreciate, when I say behave, I am not referring to terrorism. Most people in this hall this afternoon are intelligent enough to recognize that only a thin minority of Muslims ever engages in terror, even thinks about it. No, I'm referring to a kind of behavior that's much more nuanced. Mainstream complacency, passivity, and denial in the face of that terror. That's what I'm challenging. And I believe that too many Muslims today are sweeping the reality of our complacency under the rug of Islam in its ideal. And you know what that does? It effectively absolves us of our responsibility for our fellow human beings, including our fellow Muslims. That's why I'm struggling. That's why I'm passionate. And that's the main reason I knew that at a deeply cellular level, I had to write this book. After many of my public events, broad-hearted, liberal-minded non-Muslims come up to me and say, I want to support people like you who are speaking up for human rights in Islam. But I'm afraid. I'm afraid that if I do, I'll be called a racist. I've heard this too many times to not address it right away. Make no mistake, from time to time, you will be called racists if you dare to ask questions out loud about what is happening in the name of Islam today. You will be called racists. Make peace with that. But that doesn't mean leave it there. When you are accused of racism, please remind your detractors that in the last 100 years alone, more Muslims have been tortured and murdered at the hands of other Muslims than at the hands of any foreign imperial power. That's not to deny Western colonialism, not at all. It is to say that colonialism comes in many shades and many colors, and it includes Muslim imperialism of other Muslims. And if we are going to have integrity as anti-imperialists, then we have to take on all forms of imperialism. So that when you stand up for human rights in Islam, the people you are first and foremost defending are ordinary Muslims themselves. And what is racist about that? We need to get comfortable asking those kinds of questions out loud. Take strength from one thing, at least, that my fellow Muslims know only too well the power of asking questions. Maybe that's why so many fear doing it. But they don't fear asking me questions, not at all. And I'm glad for that. I have gotten, since the release of my book, so many pointed, direct, angry questions that I have a second confession to make. You'll be tested on what the first one was. The second confession is that I made a big mistake, maybe many, many more than just one, but at least one big mistake with this book, the title. The original title was The Trouble with Islam. The better title would have been The Trouble with Islam Today. Because as I take pains to point out in the pages of the book, Islam wasn't always this insular. It wasn't always this rigid or tribal. And so I've taken steps to correct my mistake. Every paperback edition in all of the languages in which it has so far been published will now be entitled, The Trouble with Islam Today. I believe in correcting our mistakes and in owning up to them. And now that I have acknowledged at least one of my imperfections, I respectfully challenge my detractors to own up to where they have gone wrong. Finally, speaking of detractors, 
I mentioned that I'd tell you a little about my mother's journey. Now, it's a very unfair segue, because it's not as if my mother has ever been a detractor. I mean, she never asked me not to write this book, probably because she knew the request would go nowhere. But she did ask me not to anger God. And I respectfully reminded her that angering some imams and mullahs and political lobbyists, Muslim and non-Muslim, does not necessarily mean angering God. I'm not sure that she bought that argument, but she held her tongue for the time that I was writing the book. And then two weeks after the book came out in Canada, my home country, my mother went to the mosque for the first time since the release of the book. She fully expected criticism. She got it in the form of the imam making a khutbah, a sermon, about why Irshad Manji is more criminal than Osama bin Laden. As my mother blinked back tears, she nonetheless stuck through the speech. And then she got something that she didn't expect. Individual members of her congregation coming up to her to say, I've read Irshad's book, and what she's saying absolutely needs to be expressed. Notice, by the way, that they didn't say, I agree with everything she's written. My own mother doesn't. Entirely her God-given right to think for herself. But they did say it's important to break deadly silences. And two more weeks after this incident, I uh, started my book tour. And I dropped in on my mom, as every good daughter author should do. And my mother, unbeknownst to me, slipped a card into my suitcase during that visit, a card which I only found upon unpacking when I returned home to Toronto. The front of the card reads Bravo. And inside, my mother wrote, among other things, my dear daughter, I'm so proud of your achievement. You go, girl. I carry this card around with me not because I need the ego boost. Listen to me on this, folks. If you want your ego stroked, do not write a book that puts you on the front lines of a lot of anger and venom and even death threats, OK? Just don't do it. I carry this card around with me because it's a visceral reminder that a devout Muslim, not just a faithful one, a devout Muslim can be open to many challenging questions, even when they hit so close to home. And I leave you with the same message that my mother gave to me. You go. Dare to ask questions out loud. That's how open societies remain open. We can't leave it up to our governments to ask the questions. God knows we can't leave it up to our media to ask questions for us. We've got to do that for ourselves. And know that when you do, at the end of the day, you will be supporting people like me who are pointing out that this effort is all about helping Islam rediscover its glorious humanitarian potential so that we all gain. We gain in diversity, in dignity, and through both of those, in security. I thank you for your ears. Dare to ask questions out loud. Let's throw it open to a Q&A. Thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Thank you, Ms. Manje, for your articulate incisive commentary. I have two questions. Uh, can, can we actually, I forgot to mention that, sorry sir, that there's a couple of ground rules to Q&As and sure. I've learned this from hard experience. Sure. One is one question per person. Okay. Uh, thank you for respecting that. And the second is feel free to make a statement instead of asking a question, but in that case please keep it to 60 seconds or fewer. Okay. Thank you sir. Uh, for many of my brothers and sisters on the left, in the past they would have, and, and the many people on this campus fall into that category, they, have no, they would have no qualms and not, I would take minor issue, issue with you, they would not be so concerned about being called racist, although some would, and being critis, critical of societies which 
in daily newspapers, day after day, there was the pathological prejudice against the other. In, this, in the case of the Islamic world, in so much of the Islamic world, Jewish people, uh, they would be willing to articulate a criticism of those societies which make their women third-class citizens, which castigate and imprison their homosexuals and suppress intellectual inquiry. Why do you think, beyond the question of fear of racism, that the American and Canadian left is so unwilling to be critical of Islamic societies for these prejudicial and suppressive measures? You've just asked me the question that I am walking around asking myself, sir. I wish I had a bullet point and indeed bulletproof answer to that one. I honestly can say I don't. What I am hypothesizing is that we live in such a deeply politicized culture today in America that anybody who dares to critique Islam is automatically tarred as a shill for George W. Bush. Um, and many people, my fellow members of the left, fear falling into that pigeonhole. I fear it as well, but that fear does not stop me from saying what needs to be said. And I actually said this to an Iranian woman this morning as I was presenting to a coalition of feminist organizations. I said, you know, you're letting the Bush administration decide what you're allowed to express and what you're not allowed to express. Why are you giving them more power? I insist on not falling into the false dichotomy of shutting up or being seen as a cheerleader for the Bush administration. I believe that there is another choice to be extracted from this false dichotomy, and that is say what you need to say in the context of supporting the universality of human rights. And if you continually make that point that it's about human rights, there is no rational way that you can be accused of being a lackey of the US administration. There's no rational way, the key word being rational. There will always be an irrational argument, in which case, when you hear it, smile, accept it, and keep making your argument. I'm uh, letting Dean Nock be the uh, moderator. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm just, sorry. I'm just curious about this concept concept of ijtihad. If you are not a Muslim, obviously if you say, let's stir up the faith, then yes, you will get the racist re remark, especially on this campus. So how as a non-Muslim can you actually approach that topic at all? Um, you know, I'm, I'm actually, I realize that what I'm about to say may sound um, completely naive. I've been called much worse, so I'll take naive as an adjective. But I'm asking people to get over the fear of being called racist. You ask, yes, you will be called, we will be called racist on this campus, so how is it that we can even begin that conversation? You begin it by beginning it, by knowing that you will be called epithets and making the argument anyway. And remember what I said in my formal remarks, that when you are alleged of racism, you're not simply gonna leave it at that and walk away and shake your head and go, you know what, there's just no point. You're going to remind the people who are accusing you of racism about the fact that more Muslims have been killed by our own than by Western powers in the last 100 years and that that's not a denial of Western imperialism but an acknowledgement that imperialism comes in many forms and then you need to challenge your accusers about how serious they are about challenging imperialism if they're willing to be so selective in which imperialism they denounce. Does that make sense? Of course, I'm asking you, please come to the microphone. Because this really is the great liberal dilemma of the early 21st century, I think. Um, I think it's a nice concept. Yeah. Uh, I feel, though, that uh, on this campus especially, the second you bring that argument to the table, you just get shut down. So I'm just more curious of ideas of outreach. I mean, you can't just start with that argument or questioning, especially uh -huh. since I'm not a Muslim. So uh -huh. what am I questioning? It's not my faith. I see, I see. Well, wait a minute, hold on. You're come, come back to the microphone. We're having a conversation okay, now, okay? Great. 
Remember, rem and this is so key. I'm so glad you said what you said because we're clarifying now. Just because you're not Muslim doesn't mean this is none of your business. Remember that what you are questioning is what is happening in the name of Islam because you're a supporter of universal human rights. That is what is at stake. It matters not at the end of the day, whether you are inside the faith or outside the faith, the question is, what are your values? Do you support the universality of human rights? And if you do, then it is your business to speak up about this. Let me ask you this. I'm going to use an analogy. Just came to mind, and forgive me if it's, uh, if it's not all well thought out, okay? But we're having a spontaneous conversation. Abu Ghraib and the obvious human rights abuses that happened at the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq. Suppose members of the military said, excuse me, torture is part of military culture. You are not a member of the military, so you do not have a right to question our culture. Would you accept that as an argument? Of course not. I'm a Berkeley student. Of course not. Exactly. Exactly. Why then would you accept the argument that, excuse me, you have no right to question what is happening in the name of Allah today because you're not a part of my culture? Don't you think that's a double standard? I definitely think it is, but then it goes back to that idea of we're debating universal truth. Yeah. And I know I get a little offended when people try to tell me, um, I'm sorry, you're wrong. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> but you would say to the Abu Ghraib torturers that, I'm sorry, you're wrong. Yeah. Why do you care? Why do you not care, I should say, whether they're offended by that? You're questioning their truths. This is a really long answer. <laughs> uh-huh. I'm, I'm listening. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, I feel the fact that the, they decided to violate something that would, okay, it's basically torture and it's murder. So the fact that they wanted to cross that line means that I'm allowed to cross that line. Uh -huh. Now they're the ones committing the torture. Right. So I'm going to cross that line with them because they already crossed it themselves. Mm -hmm. However, if someone's just sitting there minding their own business, believing what they believe, uh -huh. and I'm the one to initiate the crossing the line and offending someone, it gets a little dicey because it's like, hey, guess what? Uh, I completely disagree with your absolute truth, and uh -huh. let me tell you why. Uh -huh. Obviously, someone's going to get a little mad about that. Uh huh. I see. So you actually, I'm, 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 I'm now uh, extrapolating. You don't believe that you have much of a leg to stand on in questioning those who are silent. Let's say those Muslims who are silent about the human rights violations that is happening in the name of Allah today. It's only those who are actually inflicting the torture that ought to be questioned. Well, no, people who are going to speak up about it. I mean, if they want to sit there and have a conversation with me about what I think, uh -huh. I'll share that opinion with them as diplomatically as possible. But, I mean, your, your target audience are the people who are sitting quietly by, right? Absolutely. And I know a lot of that target audience. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes it's just difficult to have that conversation anyway because mm. it's like, hey, I'm a white girl from California, uh -huh. so, uh -huh. you know, paint me culturally insensitive. You know what? You've just racially profiled yourself. I have. We should not be accepting that in this country. Thanks again for another double standard. We're allowed to hate on the white folks. It's acceptable. It's acceptable. I don't think it is. And I speak as a brown woman, so I must be right. <laughs> All right. You can see how tedious, you know, such a back and forth can be. I actually enjoyed it, but I realize how tedious it can get for some people. Ultimately, I'm calling good, liberal-hearted, open-minded people like you on your double standards. And I applaud you, actually, for having the courage to state, you know, what, what the great dilemma is. Here's something that I'm just going to give you to think about. Actually, I'm going to say two things that I hope you get to think. I was going to say, okay, I actually have three things I want you to think about. One is... Remember Matthew Shepard, the uh, young gay man in, I believe it was Wyoming, who was uh, killed by a bunch of yahoos? And uh, I never heard any liberals say to the people who killed him, you know what? We realize that gay bashing is a part of your redneck culture. So we really don't have any right to scrutinize you for it. Sorry, sorry about, you know, about caring about this issue. Never heard any liberals say that, nor should they have said that. So again, why one standard for one culture and another standard for another? That's the first thing I want you to think about. Second, why is it that when, let's say, a Michael Moore asks blistering questions about what is happening in the name of America with the intent of fashioning a more humane and thoughtful American culture, why is he seen as a patriot 
But if you ask similar questions about what is happening in the name of a culture, or I, more to the point, as a member of the Muslim faith, am asking these kinds of questions, why would I not be seen as a partisan of introspective Islam? Why would I not be seen as, a, as an advocate of progressive Islam? Why want one standard for the Michael Moores of this world and another, let's say, for the Irshad Manjis and her supporters? Again, a double standard. Finally, the third thing to think about. There's a difference between advocating pluralism and relativism. Pluralism is that philosophy by which we embrace multiple perspectives. Relativism is that philosophy by which we cannot tell the difference between culture and torture. It's one thing to be a pluralist, entirely something else to be a relativist. Ask yourself, which do you choose to be? And then, go girl. Thanks for the talk and is this getting there? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for the talk and for raising the questions that I think were worth asking. Um, my, 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 what I find strange is that you style yourself as a liberal and more, more like a radical uh, Muslim speaker when what you have posed and many of the answers, I didn't read the book, but what you've said today you know, rhymes with many mainstream, traditional, conservative Muslim writers and thinkers in the Muslim world and in the, in the uh, West, and I will not waste my 60 seconds quoting their names. Uh, but, and while on the other hand, what you uh, uh, displayed as the mainstream Muslims is what I would call off-center off at best, closer to extreme. Uh, it, it appears to me that it has more to do with these are the most Muslims you were exposed to most of the time. And well, our standards differ, but well, I claim that this is not the, the, the mainstream, and I think many would agree. Uh, this brings me to my question, which is, you have very good questions you were entitled to ask. Uh, you've been forced not to get a reply for them for 14 years because your madrasa teacher was not taking them well. And then for 20 other years, you've been self-pursuing an answer, and you put the answer in the book, or the answers. Uh, by self-learning. Now, why would we, or should we, uh, get, take these answers at face value and think of them as unbiased and unaffected by 14 years of being oppressed and 20 years of being, you know, going on one's own, uh, and why? Right. Why should we? Right. Uh, we would not allow some self-trained engineer or um, physician to just go and say, well, I've learned my I've taught myself medicine for 20 years. I don't uh, approve what Berkeley is teaching in engineering. I'll just do it my own way right. and have the professional engineers right. association right. Uh, licensing. Well, there's actually two questions in what you've just asked. Thank you, sir. Um, let me start with the second one, because your analogy between, let's say, a doctor or an engineer and somebody who is a public intellectual is, I think, a false analogy. Um, science is one thing, philosophy is another. And some of the greatest philosophers, among whom I do not count myself, don't get me wrong, but some of the greatest philosophers are, in fact, self-taught. Socrates, for example, uh, you know, who, who I truly, truly have learned from, his Socratic method, is someone who walked around Athens asking the most irritating questions of his fellow Athenians um, so that they would not lapse into intellectual and moral complacency uh, to the point where he was actually persecuted and some would argue killed by the anger of his fellow Athenians for doing so. But he didn't need a PhD from Berkeley in order to, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, have a philosophical self-examined life and indeed in order to propose ideas that have stood the test of time and methodologies that are used right here in, uh, in major universities in the United States. So what I'm advocating is a philosophical approach to Islam. It's not about whether I'm a good engineer or a good doctor. It's about whether we take the freedoms that we have in this part of the world to indeed allow ourselves to be the philosophers that will help inject healthy competition of ideas within Islam. Now, your first question was, why should we buy what you have to say when, you know, obviously, it's based, at least in part, on some very negative experiences that you had as a madrasa uh, student? Don't buy what I have to say. 
Not at all. I actually am not here to be agreed with or disagreed with. I'm here to spark conversations where none existed before. Remember that in my formal remarks, I made it perfectly clear we are all in some way shaped by our experiences. I lump myself into that group. But you know what else that means? You too, exactly. And the very people whom you might look up to as the towering intellectual figures in Islamic philosophy today are also shaped in part by their experiences. This means we're operating on that level on an equal playing field. You can choose to buy their arguments. You can choose to reject mine. Just engage in conversation and let's hash it out as we're doing now. Thanks. Uh, I think, yes, there was a Muslim woman back there. Thank you. That's a bit tall for me. <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> It's okay, I think I'll be heard. Okay, there we go. I'm glad you said I know the feeling because my question is about emp empathy. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Anyways, my question runs in, in line with my fellow, but um, whereas he questioned the fact that you had your own experience, I question where you got that sense of empathy from. Your empathy for, let's, Muslim women and for people living in under Islamist, what you call Islamist, and according to your interpretation, perversions of Islam, conveying perversions of Islam regime. Um, I c there, there would be many counterclaims to that. One of them would be that it takes coexistence to create empathy. One of them would be that in a Western context, as the one you've been living in all your life, there are certain images of what is the other and from your conversation or from your, from your uh, talk, I got that many of those images have been infiltrating into your own conception again of what is the other and at many instances divorcing them from the contextual reality. Can you give me an example? Um, I, would, I would say the, ca the case of Muslim women. I would not, you know, neither justify nor deny the fact that there are uh, oppressions of the sort you've been talking about, but I would definitely assert that the context, had you been there and you know, coexisted or seen the reality on the ground, you would have experienced it very differently. Uh, tell me how I would have experienced it. Um, you would have experienced, I would say, how the social economic, political reality would make a difference to your um, conclusions about the state of affairs, that it was not only cultural. I, I feel that you have um, sort of plugged out the cultural out of the bigger context of the other aspects that are usually there on the ground. So when we're talking about a Muslim family, we're not talking about uh, a family living in an Islamic cultural setting, and that's it. We're talking about a family living in I a socio-economic, political setting, and usually both parties are undergoing oppressions of the very same sort. Okay. So, um, and, and this is, a, again, this would be also a very simple counter-argument, and there would be yeah. no many more complex ones. I'm, I'm not a sociologist, so I cannot. Sure, sure. Thank you for that. I think I know what you're driving at. And I, and I, unless I'm completely misconstruing what you've just said, and if I am, you'll let me know, I hope, that you're not so much um, uh, disagreeing with um, the fact that I have said uh, that many Muslim women um, are oppressed today in the Islamic world, but rather I think what you're telling me is it has much more to do, Irshad, than just with culture and just with religion. There are economic imperatives here, there are political conditions here, and the analysis needs to be more complex. Is that, is that about correct? Sort of? Okay, okay, I hear you. I know, it's, it's not easy. It's not easy to explain any of this stuff. It's very, very layered. Um, but, you know, I would wonder then what you would say to those researchers, Arab researchers, those writers, Arab writers, 
who put together the United Nations' own Arab Human Development Reports, who in each of their reports have concluded that there are three key deficits in the Arab Muslim world today. The deficits of knowledge, of freedom, and of women's empowerment. And the conclusions that I've reached do not differ from theirs. The interesting thing is, they are on the ground. They do include this kind of analysis in their reports, and yet they reach the same conclusions that I have as a journalist from talking to thousands of women in the Muslim world. So how is it that my conclusions may not be as legitimate as what these Arab researchers and writers have, uh, have expressed? question their legitimacy as much as I would question their uh, line of argumentation. But I'm, okay, then let me, let me actually Im implore you to just get a little bit more specific, because I'm, I'm feeling a lot of vagueness here. Tell me in plain language, where have I gone wrong? <laughs> and where have they gone wrong? Uh, I cannot at this spur of the moment. I was sitting there and at many points in time I was feeling that though the conclusions might have some resonance, the, the way they were derived did not. I felt that Can I ask you one question? Or I actually have asked you many. Can I ask you one more? Yeah, just a moment. Are you sure that what you're saying to me is not born, speaking of where things are derived, is not born of a certain defensiveness based on identity? Mm. I wouldn't say so because you sort of disarmed me when you said don't get defensive. So I, I, I worked as much as I could on disarming myself when you said that and tried to just right. take the line of logic. Okay, I'll invite you then, just as a final point, mm -hmm. Michael, I'll invite you to email me at my uh, Muslim Refusenik address. I have a contact me link on my homepage mm -hmm. and let me know in due course where you think my analysis has gone wrong. I'd love to engage. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry to give you all the Muslims all at once here. But, um, all Muslim all the time. <laughs> you know, I, I was pleasantly surprised with your beginning, and I agreed with a lot of your assumptions, and, and I do welcome analysis of what is wrong with our community. But listening to you talk towards the end, I felt like I was in a classroom where I give a lot of presentations about Islam, and the kid, inevitably, who raised his hand and said, what do you guys eat in Islam? Or, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. What do you guys eat in Islam? Or what games do you play in Islam? Because what I'm hearing is this monolithic Islam where all the women are uneducated, don't have money, don't have a job, and all of it is because of Islam. And on this very campus, I have four or five Muslim friends who are PhDs in chemical engineering who are working in the bio lab. That stereotype, and I think that can also answer the question, why are liberals not comfortable siding with you? It feeds into the very stereotype types that are out there every day in the media and hate re radio that turn us into non-humans. We're all just Islams. <laughs> so that's the problem I had with the latter part of your speech. Right. I'm so upset with myself because most of the time when I make presentations like this and I start off by talking about Muslim women, I make it really clear, I didn't today, I will now, I make it really clear that I know there are many Muslim women who go to universities like this who are saying, excuse me, I already know about my God-given right to think for myself, thank you very much. I have a PhD. I've got a great job. I am educated. I am my own person. Let me acknowledge that, and I'm sorry, I'm kicking myself that I didn't do that earlier, whereas most of the time I do. But why do I acknowledge it most of the time? In order to challenge the assumption that then flows from that. The assumption that flows from that is because someone like you or the you know, five women, Arab or Muslim women whom you know have PhDs, have those PhDs, somehow, therefore, things are okay for them. Things are fine. You know, it's not a monolithic poverty of spirituality and thought that Muslim women are undergoing. With all due respect, and I really mean that, I find that type of an assumption to be highly selfish. Because the assumption is, if I'm not going through the oppression, then it's okay. 
I'm saying it's precisely because you are not going through that oppression and those five PhD holders are not going through that oppression that you and I have to use our privilege on behalf of the millions upon millions of Muslim women who live in villages, in rural areas, and indeed even in urban areas who do not yet know that it is their God-given right to think for themselves. And that means that we've got to have empathy for them. We've got to use our privilege to exercise our voices on behalf of those who don't yet have those voices, but who, inshallah, will. And I've got to challenge that latent selfishness among us privileged Muslim women. Well, I, I mean, maybe I made a mistake in talking about women in Berkeley. I, mean, I actually have lived in Jordan, where the same percentage of women are in the colleges of medicine, of engineering, because in most Middle Eastern countries, and by the way, only 18% of all Muslims are Arab. So when we talk about an right. Arab study, sure. That excludes most of the Muslim world. But in, in the country that I lived in, in high school, you will automatically go into the sciences or the humanities. And if you do well in the sciences, you will automatically go into the field of engineering and medicine. And when I tell this to audience, they are shocked. So what I'm, what I'm asking you, please, do not continue the stereotyping that is affecting me, my daughter, and, and millions of Muslim women around the world who are as varied as Christians and Jews, and when we talk about the problems women face, we are talking about the same problems that women in Mexico, women in Guatemala, women in non-Muslim countries in the third world, I think 90% to, to as high as maybe 99% are shared problems, and they are not all related to religion. So we have to have a more nuanced approach, otherwise we do end up with the same conclusion that you know, people on the religious right, people who do hate speech, and, and a whole slew of people are leading to, and I think that's the answer to the question, and it would make me a lot more comfortable. Okay. I think you'd garner a lot more support yeah. Uh, yeah. from Muslims if you, if you looked at it that way. Okay, you know what, I'll think, yeah, I'll think further, certainly, about what you've said, and I appreciate, you know, your constructive uh, recommendation to me. I thank you for it. Um, but I'm going to end by saying this, that, you know what I worry about? Is that people who express those kinds of concerns underestimate the intelligence of other people out there. And I know that's a crazy thing to say on the Berkeley campus, because hey, we're so smart at this university, and everybody else really isn't as smart as us. But you know what? In the year and a half that my book has been out, I can tell you that the emails that I've received from people who acknowledge themselves as evangelical Christians or right-wingers, I can count on one hand those who have said to me, you're just a shill for the Islamists, Irshad Manji. You're just, you're just apologizing for what's happening in Islam today. You, you know, leave it, ditch it. You, this is a satanic religion. I have yet to hear from anybody who has said, thank you for reinforcing my racism. What I do hear from, much, much more, are those who say, and I remember this from a recent email, when I started reading your book, I had a metaphorical baseball bat in my hand and you helped me put down that baseball bat because you've shown me that there are liberal thinkers within Islam. Thank you for helping bust my stereotypes. Please, as you implore me to get more nuanced about Islam, I implore you to get more nuanced about the American public. And if you agree to do that, I'm happy to agree to continue taking your recommendations. That'll be a pact, and we're going to do this together. <laughs> Deal? Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>